active duty service members, veterans, family members, thank you for your service. And thank you for listening to Return to Roots Mildevet Resource Podcast, where we document our shared experiences, stories, and transitioning and reintegrating from the military to the community. Hosted by two transitioning service members, myself, Chris Elder, and my partner in crime, Jonathan Hernandez. For more information, go to mill2vet.com. If you have little ears, ensure you listen to the content before you allow them to listen. And if you are in crisis and homelessness, suicide ideations, or incarceration, dial 211, Courage to Call for assistance. Now, stand by for the sound of freedom. Today we have the honor to speak with Army veteran Nate Boyer, who's also with Emerging Vets and Players. Enjoy the show. Return to Roots fam, welcome. Today we have a very special guest. He is a former Green Beret, former NFL player. He co-founded an awesome organization called Merchant Vets with Players. His focus or their focus is to bring awareness to the transition that we both experience both once we take once we take the uniform off. And for both of us, it is a very difficult transition that we don't really see or experience, right? And we have no idea um, that that happens. So, he will be sharing part of his journey, a lot of valuable insights, and we're excited to welcome our very own Nate Boyer to the show. Hey, Nate, thanks for coming on here, brother. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the MVP project? Yeah, MVP, uh, it stands for Merging Vets and Players. It's a charity I co-founded with Jay Glazer back in 2015. Uh, and we bring together combat vets and former professional athletes and help them find purpose and identity when they lose a uniform. Um, you know, I myself, I, I was very fortunate to be able to do a little bit of both, spend time in both those locker rooms. Um, roughly 10 years in the uh, in the Army, first half in, in, on active duty and the second half in the Texas National Guard. And then, uh, you know, went on to play uh, college football at the University of Texas uh, while I was in the Guard. And um, and then get an opportunity with the Seattle Seahawks after I'd left the military. And then when I got cut from the Seahawks, you know, I went from having this group of people, um, you know, this locker room, uh, that I always felt kind of had my back and I, I knew the people around me were, uh, you know, as dedicated as me to the mission and the goal. And, um, you know, whether we're out there, you know, playing a game or uh, on the battlefield, um, I, I had those people I could rely on and I knew I had to do my job for us to be successful. And, uh, you know, one thing we wanted to be careful of when we started this organization was making sure that we're never comparing war to playing sports. Cause it's, it's very different. The stakes are not the same. Uh, and if you talk to pretty much any athlete, especially ones part of our program, they always hesitate to make any comparisons about, you know, their lives to, to, to our lives. But the reality is there are a lot of comparisons to be made from a team perspective, from a, um, a brotherhood camaraderie perspective, from an identity with a uniform perspective, and from a often a difficulty transitioning perspective, you know, the struggle with trying to uh, uh, feel like you'll ever be great again and part of a team like that, you know, that's very similar. So, um, you know, when I, when I went to S Seattle, I had left the military, but I hadn't really thought about what a transition would be like. Um, because I had that, I had football and I had that team and that uniform. And it was like, I had to focus all my energy on that. I couldn't think about, you know, uh, what, what would be next or what it would, what it would be, what it would be like to no longer have that team or have a, you know, the camouflage anymore. And then when I got cut from the Seahawks, that's when it hit me. It was like, Whoa. Um, I never even took the time to kind of say goodbye to the military. <laughs> I just sort of ran into this other thing, this other uh, career and this other life. And, and, uh, and now I don't even have that 
world, you know, that one's gone too. And that's when I kind of had my like, you know, oh crap moment. I was, I was the 34 years old, which is, you know, it's not young, young, but it's not old. I had a lot, a lot, a lot of good uh, years left in me and, and felt like I had a lot to contribute still. Um, and still felt like I was, you know, physically, like I could do it. I could do, I could go out there and still play or still go serve. And like, like I'm, I'm good. Um, but it just didn't feel like that was possible anymore. So I was, you know, grasping at things, trying to figure out how to recapture that feeling, challenging myself, you know, go, go climb Mount Kilimanjaro, go run a marathon, go do something like that. And there's nothing wrong with that stuff. It's great. I love that stuff, but it's not gonna, it's not, um, sustaining, you know what I mean? To, to, to make you feel like, uh, like you're, you're okay. You need to be, you need to be able to spend some time in those quiet moments as well. And when, when, when everything's kind of switched off and, uh, to know if you're really accepting this transition or this, this, uh, this development, you know, and change in your life. So, um, I, I was like, kind of trying to figure that out. And Jay Glazer suggested that we start an organization that brings these two groups together that are dealing with what I was feeling right then. And that's why we started MVP. And uh, we started in Los Angeles. He had a gym there, has a gym there called Unbreakable Performance Center that he opened the doors uh, for a bunch of vets to come in on, you know, once a week at no cost, get a workout in, and then we'd huddle up and kind of talk through our stuff. And it's like a, it's like a high end gym, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a fight gym and a lot of pro athletes go there and, um, so it's like, it's not like we're just meeting up at no, no offense, but it's not like we're, we're going to, to a 24 hour fitness or something, you know, and like getting together. It's like, it's a pretty, it feels like a special place. That's just ours. Like the doors are closed just for us. And we were getting 30, 40 guys in there, you know, probably 80 to 90% vets. And then, you know, fewer pro athletes, just when you run the numbers, that's, that's probably, that's probably more accurate to how, what it looks like anyway, the breakdown, but, um, but it was really cool to hear and be a part of uh, us, you know, willing to be vulnerable and kind of talk through those struggles, but also help each other. Like when somebody comes in with something, they're 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 trying to figure out an, an issue in their life or something they're having trouble letting go of from a, a decade ago. To have other people in that room that kind of understand where they're coming from, it can help with some suggestions and talk through. Hey, I, I felt that same way at this time. This is what I did. You know, it worked for me. Maybe maybe try that. Um, and that, and so MVP was sort of organically developed out of, um, those people that just started coming up to the gym, you know, for a workout and a hangout after. So tell us how that merged into filming the movie. Cause that's pretty cool. I mean, yeah. we were there, we saw Appreciate the movie you. and we were part of it and it was fantastic. It was fascinating, but I, I, Shoot, it froze for two seconds. I yeah, know you're gonna have to re re restate that, uh, Yogi. I just want our listeners to be able to listen to how that came from you already transitioning, doing all this stuff to now filming a movie, the whys and the house and everything. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that, Yogi. Thanks, and uh, um, you know, thanks for singing his praises. It, it, it uh, it certainly wasn't any, it wasn't easy to do. We, uh, we shot this film in the middle of the pandemic. Um, it was mostly, mostly veterans and athletes that made the movie, uh, you know, both in front of and behind the camera. Uh, proud to say that, that every veteran portrayed on screen is played by an actual vet, which is really cool. Um, including uh, Dan Loria from the Wonder Years, the dad on the Wonder Years back in the day. Like he plays the, you know, the barracks administrator there and he's a, uh, he's a Vietnam vet. Um, but it, it was just cool to kind of have that, uh, have all those people step up and do that. But, you know, we, when, when COVID started um, to shut down the gyms around the country, that, that created a, an immediate problem for us because that's where we do our, our work every week, you know? And so all of a sudden we didn't have that place we could meet up weekly and, and, and we transitioned to zoom. Thank, thank goodness for that, for those kind of, uh, you know, like we're on right now, <laughs> those kind of platforms where we could at least, uh, you know, stay, stay connected, still conduct 
uh, you know, weekly uh, um, huddles. And we were having like 100 people on these things because by this time we've got, we had five chapters around the country. So people are just jumping on to, to be a part of it weekly. And we're doing like an online workout. We have a trainer leading us through the, through a Zoom workout. Everyone does it in their living room or wherever they're at. And then, uh, and then we would um, kind of huddle afterwards, but it was tough. It, you know, it, it, the human connection being, being in, in the, in the gym with some, with people and, you know, in person, it's just a lot different. People feel a lot more comfortable sharing when they got something going on. It's a little tough when you got people from all over the country on this Zoom and, you know, you don't know, you know, you know, you don't know if, if somebody's, you know, you don't know these people personally. So you, it's harder to trust if that makes sense. So as things went on and eventually, you know, I, I was working in, in, uh, in film and TV already a bit. Uh, I'd hosted a few things, co-created a few projects, did some acting um, and really wanted to try my hand at directing uh, something. And, I knew whatever I did, especially for my first project, it wasn't going to, we weren't going to have a lot of money behind it. When I say not a lot of money, I say movie money because movies are crazy expensive. So, you know, our movie, while it's considered an ultra low budget film, it's still, you know, still over six, six figures. It's like, you know, stuff's expensive. Um, but as we got into like the fall and this uh, Screen Actors Guild kind of put out their guidelines for COVID testing and what they were gonna allow. Uh, we just said, all right, here's the rules. Let's do it, let's figure it out. So we shot this movie in Los Angeles, which was pretty much closed in September, October of 2020, um, which helped us. I mean, I don't wanna say like COVID, I'm not happy that COVID happened. It sucked in a lot of ways um, beyond, you know, getting sick and, and, and you know, having, having uh, health problems. It just, we all know, I mean, it was like a very trying time, um, you know, with the isolation and all this, but I'll also say without it and everything being shut down like that, like we had this opportunity to uh, conduct some type of business out there. And there was a lot of people in the industry that just wanted to get back to work and, and do something. And, and this pod project was a passion project for them. And so we've, we had some really talented actors and and filmmakers, uh, producers, you know, all 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 stages of the uh, process of of the of filmmaking, post production as well, that you know took a pretty substantial pay cut to to work with us and locations that just opened their doors and said, "Hey, you know, we ain't going to charge you. Um, just clean up when you're done because we're closed anyway. <laughs> but we appreciate what you guys are doing." So that went a long way, and uh, that's how we got this thing made. But uh, I, I co-wrote it with a with a uh, a British uh, veteran. Well, he's actually from Wales, but he was in the UK military. And and then um, Sylvester Stallone, his company, um, they put their name on it because they really wanted to. They love MVP, the organization. They wanted to see it happen, and and they didn't ask for anything. You know, it's not like they were um, expecting this thing to make a bunch of money. <laughs> they just wanted to see it get made. And they thought, well, you know what, if I if Sloan thought if I lend my name, I bet it'll help. And it sure did. Got a lot of people to read it uh, in the first place. And, and um, it's, it's a big part of the reason that we got it done, got it made. And his producing partner, Braden Aftergood, well, like helped us with script notes and ideas and casting and all that stuff. So we, uh, we just kind of, we just kind of went for it. And um, it was, it was, uh, you know, the, everything was on location. We shot in Jay Glazer's gym. We shot at a, a veterans homeless shelter in town um, where a lot of these people had lived that the story was sort of based on. Um, some of the people in the movie actually spent time there, um, living there for a bit. And, uh, and then um, we, yeah, we just kind of, we just kind of went for it. Shot, shot at the post, uh, post 43 American Legion there on Highland Avenue is kind of an iconic place and all these places and and and, uh, and people really just open their doors and open their hearts and uh, we it was very collaborative you know we made it as a group you know what you said there about when you're getting out of the military and then you just kind of ran right into playing football and then all of a sudden you find yourself having to leave football because you were cut from a team and and then it just kind of led into this formation of this group and you, you start like really making some 
some really big connections and then COVID just kind of hits right and stops all that for you and then you turn around and you're like you know what but let's let's adapt let's continue to connect that's that that sounds like a lot of resiliency was formed you know, um, around this whole entire MVP movement. So hearing uh, kind of COVID wasn't just a disadvantage, but it was also an advantage for the whole entire MVP because I remember all the gyms were shut down. Right. And then you guys are making a, a, a story that has the gym in the middle of it. And there's a lot of people that can connect with that. So that was that was one thing that I caught was like um, when when I was watching the movie, I knew that it was filmed right around COVID. You know, not only is it a, a brother of my uh, a brother in arms, sister in arms, that's being centerpiece in these in this film MVP, but it's also um, the fact that they were doing it during COVID when a lot of people were just shut down. So that, yeah. that's, that's the, a lot of the inspiration. There's a lot of inspiration in the film. There's a lot of inspiration that surrounds the film. And it was just crazy. I'm sitting there watching this, this movie with people I had just met um, and we're all just bawling towards the end. Like we, I didn't even know what I was walking into Yogi too. I just kind of invited him. And we just show up to this this uh, special viewing, and you know, I'm like, oh, Nate Boyer, I've heard of him. He's a Seahawks because uh, I'm a Seahawks fan. And then all of a sudden, the, the show comes on, and like all this whirlwind of emotions hit. So you guys did a fantastic job with the film, but I think what really hits at home is that it's not it's not just a made up story. It's it's genuine. You had genuine people in the film around the film it, it's just the authenticity is just off the chart so like thank you for for capturing that i appreciate that man that that really does mean a lot um I, and i think you know i'm not just trying to deflect here i'm being completely honest like the reason for that is because it was us telling our own story like across the board you know um because even the people that weren't veterans uh, or, or athletes that worked on it and there were some and they, and they did a hell of a job the fact that around set every day, you have all these people that lived it. <laughs> you just, you take it that much more seriously. And, you know, I mean, even like our, our, from the, from the person who was doing wardrobe and makeup, like she, and she was doing both of those things, which was pretty incredible. Um, you know, she was a vet and, and uh, our, our first AD, you know, the assistant director, uh, he was a vet. Uh, a couple of the producers were veterans. Um and just, yeah, just so many, so many jobs on set. The, the guy that did the score also lives in Wales. He's buddy with the co-writer. He did the, he did the, the music for the film. Like, you know, Wiz Khalifa, Wiz Khalifa gave us a song because both his parents were vets and he was just like, you know, like, yeah, it, it's, it's really cool. So all those things, because it was, it was people more than just like the movie kind of talks about it was people in, more than saying thank you for your service they were showing it <laughs> by showing up and giving their time and, and expertise and like i'll tell you what a lot of us including myself probably me more than anybody that 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 we're you know that are veterans that are want to work in that industry and are doing our best and we're hustling like we're a little you know we're we're behind the power curve on some things because we spent the first half of our life doing this other thing you know and so for a lot of us it's new and, and we feel like we haven't gotten the same amount of uh, opportunities or we feel, oh, you know, I'm in my thirties, man. I don't want to be that weird guy. That's like trying to start over and go to film school and all this stuff. And so, it, you know, it, it's, it's like, you, you gotta, you gotta get past that personally. You gotta be able to take that step, but you also need those people that are willing to mentor you, you know, and kind of guide you along the way. So we had, we had all that. And uh, not that it wasn't hard every day, man, there was, it was arguments and freaking everything's going wrong. It's just like a, it's like a training. It's like a military training operation. It's not like, once again, it's not like war. <laughs> it ain't like that, but it's like you're in the field, you know, doing, doing an FDX or whatever. And like, just everything's going wrong. There's wrenches being thrown at you. The weather changes. You're just, ugh. but at the end of the day, you're like, we got it done, you know, and you're ready to go, 
you know, have a, have a glass of whiskey or something <laughs> and go to sleep and wake up and do it all over again at, you know, 6am again, just like, just like when we were training. So it's, uh, it was fun like that. Like, I, I can't wait to do another one. I haven't had the opportunity yet, but um, you know, we got, we, we got uh, licensed by Showtime and um, if you don't have Showtime, you can still go see it on Amazon Prime and Apple TV and all that. But now that it's out there and people are seeing it, um, it's been cool to see the reaction of some industry professionals, you know, that are like, all right, man, like, it's not perfect. Uh, but it's, but that's what's great about it. Like, you know, I think, uh, uh, and no, mo no movie truly is. I mean, I don't know, maybe there's a few out there, um, some iconic ones that are pretty much the perfect movie, but um it just sort of showed that that what we're capable of, you know, when we are given an opportunity and we come together, even if we're given a, a lot of uh, guardrails and, um, you know, limitations, w whether it's budgetary or, um, the, the, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the social climate or the actual climate <laughs> or uh, whatever's going on, pandemics, like, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll make the mission, you know. Um, and uh, and find a way and so that, so that's that's the that's the coolest part about this whole process is that we just got it done not only that we got it done we got it done and we got it out there you know and people are able to see it now one of the things that i want to mention man uh and for me as i was watching the movie next to chris of course um and as he, saw, he mentioned before i mean we really did start bombing it was not not a figure of speech it was like everybody in that audience was legitimately crying and in their feelings and i mean you talked about the homelessness you talked about the suicide rates you talked about how difficult it is to get a job and uh you know the people sometimes when you do the transition how you get divorced how you have right. problems with your children and all that other stuff i mean you you hit the major um things that we go through as a transition. And for me and Chris, I mean, when we saw the movie, we were beginning our transition, right? We, we were starting to, that was actually part of the reason why we ended up there in the first place. And we're super lucky and blessed to be there. And cause that was a chain of events that led to the, the creation of this podcast in the first place and our community and everything else like that. I mean, believe it or not, you're, you're part of our inspiration on this being here. So we thank you for that. And we also, I mean, it was so, so different to see it. We're, we're as a civilian right before I joined the Navy to as you're, you know, thinking that you're going to do the however many years in the military. Right. And then now as a transition in service member, you're like, wow this is this is not a joke this is real this is not corny this is not anything else this is what everybody actually goes through and just to see it on screen it was just mind-blowing so thank you for that um i want to talk about if you don't mind about, about what kind of impact have you had um for our listeners on how many you mentioned that you had at that, that point five chapters. How many chapters do you have now? How many members do you have? And all that other stuff. Yeah. So since then, we've grown to eight chapters. So we're, uh, we're in Los Angeles, Las Vegas, Chicago, Atlanta, uh, New York, Seattle, Dallas, and Phoenix. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah, we're getting there. We, we actually have our, uh, our first gala coming up on May 6th up in uh, Dallas, uh, which is really cool. So we're, we're really growing, you know, I mean, we're seven years old now. And uh, we're finally like, you know, seven years old, I, I'll say, I'll make an excuse for us. You know, we had a little bit of a slowdown over the last three years, <laughs> with everything from, from COVID to the economy to all this stuff. But we've still grown leaps and bounds. I think we've got roughly 4000 members. Um, you know, and that doesn't mean that 4,000 people come to session every week, but it's like people that have been and have stayed connected with us, we consider members, you know, and they come back from time to time. We, we do other events as well. And, um, so it's been, it's been really cool to, uh, to see that growth. Um, and we want to keep growing, you know, we, we're hoping to open, uh, uh, one or two more this year. We'll see, 
it kind of, you kind of got to, you know, in a sense, like follow the money sounds bad, but it's true with the nonprofit, like where, you know, you have these places and individuals, whether it's private donors, whether it's corporations that want to see MVP um, where they're at, um, you, you know, you sort of you make your way there. You know, we may end up, we're starting to work with Walmart now. We may may, up, may end up in little, little uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, uh, which is not that little, it's growing, but um, you know, things like that, it, it just kind of where, wherever, wherever we can, but we're always going to be available virtually, uh, regardless. Um, but yeah, we, we want to keep growing. And, and that was one of the intentions of the film too, is like share our message, share how we started, what we're about, some of the things that we, um, uh, sort of, you know, how a lot of us feel generally, because like this, this, the script was written from the stories and, and the things that have been said in the, those huddles, you know what I mean? Like we, we wrote it. Yes, but it, it feels in some ways more transcribed and then, you know, built into a cohesive uh, storyline because it's like so many of those phrases. One of my favorite ones is the, uh, my, you know, uh, most of my post-traumatic stress comes from lack of, lack of traumatic stress. That was uh, something, uh, that's something a veteran told me on uh, in LA on v Ventura Boulevard one day, we were just talking and, he was working on some project and he'd been through a lot, you know, he, uh, he, uh, was, you know, physically wounded overseas. And, um, but he said that, you know, and I, I kind of related to that. I was like, that's true. You know, sometimes I just, the stillness and the, um, the quiet, like that's, that's, that's sometimes the, uh, the least, what, we, what you would consider the least stressful times can be uh, the most stressful times for me. Cause I'm just like, I need it. I need a problem to solve. I need a project, you know, I need to fix something and work on something and fight for something. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's how that, that's how the story was built. And, and we hope that the story will help us build more as far as MVP chapters around the country. Yeah, brother, that that's amazing that you guys have been able to grow and that the movie it accomplishes one thing you know, it's helping our brothers and sisters that are done with the stuff. And I love that you're like, hey, we didn't just individually write the movie script. It was transcripted. That was that was beautiful, brother. Uh, I love how you put put the put the success right where it should be. And that's into the tribe. So uh, I, I appreciate you uh, talking to that point before we slide over to the save. Browns and alibis. Do you have anything else, brother, you want to talk about? Um, you know, I, I, I do. It was announced this week, so we can talk about it, but it's a, uh, it'll, I think it'll help in the, in the realm of being able to tell more of our stories down the road. But, you know, I, I, back in September, I hosted a, a discovery channel series down in Panama. Um, that'll be, uh, it'll be coming out in July. Um, it's called Survive the Raft, and it's kind of like Survivor, um, but it's a little different in the sense of there was a big focus on all these people coming from very different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds and race, religion, you know, political beliefs, and they had to work together and live on this raft together um, to try and, you know, work, work towards a common goal. And uh, it was it was really <laughs> it was really fun to watch, you know, and, and like I said, I, I hosted it. So I was more just kind of introducing the challenges and, um, you know, facilitating conversations between the crew members and stuff like that. But um, pretty wild stuff. So I'm excited for that to come out. It'll it'll be uh, it'll be on Discovery and, and HBO Max, which is going to be soon called just Max because they, they merge with uh, Discovery Plus. And so. There's going to be this new streamer called Max that that was HBO Max, and that's all that's all changing next month. But anyway, it'll be out in July, and so that's kind of cool, brother. That's that's super exciting, man. Uh, that's that's fantastic. I'm definitely going to check that out. So as we well, slide into, hopefully the... you get past the pilot, you know, <laughs> and stay with it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, man. Uh, yeah, brother. Uh, we're going to slide into the save rounds and alibis. All right, so. Nate, do you have any recommendations of books and or podcasts that really helped you out during your journey? Hmm. Well, the podcast stuff's new relative to my life. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm 42. So that, I mean, I know it's been around longer than that, but I, you know, it's kind of been popularized only in the last few years here. Um, 
I mean, I'm like everybody else in the sense of not everybody else, but a lot of people like I do enjoy, um, you know, listening to to some of the people that go on Joe Rogan's podcast. It's obviously a huge podcast, but you know, the, the variety and diversity of guests is so interesting. Um, and uh, sort of letting, letting those people feel like they can speak freely in a different way um, than they have in the past. Um, so I really enjoy that, you know, from a, from a book standpoint, um, I mean, I really, I really, when I was younger, I really liked, you know, like the, 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 uh, kind of the, some of the great American authors, like, like Hemingway and Steinbeck and, um, you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald and some of these just like legends. Um, I remember, I remember, uh, I read East of Eden, which is a Steinbeck novel over the course of, I think just two or three days. Um, cause I was just so hooked on it and it was, uh, you know, it's a very simple story about this American family, you know, growing up around the great, great depression timeframe. I think that's sort of his, uh, sweet spot era, um, with a lot of his stories. It definitely is with grapes of wrath and all this stuff, but, um, and then like Hemingway, you know, snows of Kilimanjaro. I read that on the way to Africa to go climb Kilimanjaro, which was kind of cool. And, um, the old man in the sea is one of those books you can read and, a couple of hours uh and it's just it's so fascinating but it's the whole story takes place you know it's just a guy with a fish on <laughs> you know uh this when you can tell simple stories like that but they just the characters are so interesting like that's the kind of stuff i want to watch and a lot of the those type of stories are what inspire me film wise um they're hard to make because sometimes nothing really happens <laughs> but if you can pull that off and and people can really relate to the characters and kind of see them grow in some way, some way, or let something go, you know, I think that's very relatable for everybody's life. Cause some of these, you know, big, big blockbuster stories, whether it's a book or a movie or whatever, they're very, they're fascinating and fun, but they're not relatable. So I don't know how much that, you know, apart from it being pure entertainment, how much of that, uh, those kind of things really help people. So, um, you know, I've always, I've always loved that stuff. When I was a kid, it was sports period, like sports books. I read all the Matt Christopher books. I don't know if you know who Matt Christopher is, but he read all these books. I mean, I, from when I was probably, oh, I don't know, fifth or f five or six years old until I was, uh, you know, nine or 10. Like I just, I tore through all of those books and, uh, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of, you know, of, of, of what else I, I, uh, I really enjoy. I mean, there's so much, <laughs> there's a lot of great stuff out there. You know, I really, I really enjoyed, um, John Krakauer's novel on, uh, uh, Pat Tillman. I think it's, uh, where, where men win glory or something like that. I may have the title wrong, but that one's really interesting because I think there was, there was definitely a preconceived notion or assumption of, by a lot of people about, what was important to Pat Tillman, what type of person that he was, because he left this big NFL contract to go serve his country and then was unfortunately killed by friendly fire, um, which was, you know, heartbreaking. And it was also sad to kind of see how it, you know, it took a long time for the truth of that story to come out and, and, and how that happened. Um, but anyway, kind of to hear where he came from and what motivated him and all that was, was, uh, it was cool. You know, it was cool to like see that and feel like, okay, this guy's sort of cut from a different cloth too. Cause that's how I feel. I don't feel like I'm the typical, you know, the typical story of somebody that graduates high school and, and maybe joins the military because they're just a very patriotic person or they always know they wanted to do this. Like I, I didn't know, I didn't know until I was 23 and I was kind of lost, you know, and, and then it just nine 11 had happened and, you know, uh, I wasn't doing anything particularly um, great with my life, or at least I felt that way. And, uh, it ended up not only, um, being an, an opportunity for me to move forward, but it was like, it completely changed my life and, you know, instilled this confidence and drive and belief in myself and, and this passion for wanting to do more and, and always commit to, um, making the world a better place or at least attempting to. And so, you know, when I heard when I read his story about, kind of hit you know he was a he was sort of an out there hippie type dude you know when he was playing college football at Arizona State and um, but he was also very um, passionate about uh, 
you know, his country and, and the United States, you know, the American dream and all these things. And um, not always happy with his country, but passionate, you know, and about its people. And I think that's, I think that's super interesting. And I, I related to that. So, yeah. So I have three for the price of one question, right? And the next question is one of my favorites. What advice would you give your younger self before you joined the military, as you're transitioning out of the military, and now for your specific case, as you transition out of the NFL? Um, I think my younger self, how young is the first question? How young would you say? 18 ish yeah. around, around that yeah, area. Yeah. Okay. Um, I actually at 18, I was proud of myself. I wasn't ready to go to college and I didn't. I moved down to San Diego. I started working on a fishing boat. I was trying things, which was great. I got stuck about a year later, <laughs> 19, 20, um, around there. I I, I moved up to Los Angeles because I was interested in film and TV, right? And kind of passionate about it. But I just didn't think I deserved it, you know? And so I didn't really pursue it because I was like, well, you're not good enough, man. You're going to screw it up anyway. So I just kind of floundered and wasted what I felt like four years of my life. Uh, I wouldn't say wasted because I was learning a lot. Um, so wasted is not the right word, but I, I just wish I would have gone for it earlier. It took me a while to understand that in life, you just got to go. You got to walk through the door. You got to... Um, you know, start making mistakes, start taking some swings. Like you just have to start doing something. Nothing's going to come to you. Um, it doesn't work like that. You know, wait, waiting for that moment, waiting for, uh, you know, the, the perfect situation to arise or the signs, you know, or the stars to align. Like it just doesn't happen sometimes. It doesn't happen most of the time. You just gotta, you have to kind of make your luck. You know what I mean? You have to go out there and you know, play your cards and kind of go after some things. And then maybe it'll change. Maybe your idea of right now of what you want to do is going to completely change. Um, but you have to be moving forward, you know, progressing and, and uh, um, just trying things. You know, that, that was my big, that, the, the biggest regret there. It was just taking too long to do that. So I would, I would tell that younger, that younger self, man, go get, get out there. What are you doing? What are you waiting for? Um, coming out of the military, uh, I think I would, um, if I was talking to myself just about to come out of the military, uh, sort of what I alluded to earlier, I would, I would, I'd make sure that I set a kind of a proper goodbye to it and, and do a better job of keeping in touch with the guys that were still in and trying to connect with people that were out almost immediately, you know, that were in my same situation. And I just didn't, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Uh, and I didn't realize, uh, you know, what, uh, what I would need. I didn't, I didn't realize that the, uh, that, that veteran community would be so important to me and be a big part of my life. I didn't really think about being a veteran at all. I just thought, you know, uh, I was in the military and now I'm not, you know, I didn't think about this other, that that would kind of carry, you know, carry with you. And a lot of those, um, pieces would, uh, um, would feel like you're, you're, you're sort of hanging on to them or, or whatever. Um, and then, you know, leaving football, uh, that's a good one. I never really thought about that. What I would, what I would, uh, say to myself, leaving the game, um, you know, probably, probably just enjoy every second you, you have out on the field, you know, you're so lucky to be able to play, whether it's at, a, I mean, at any level <laughs> to play, to play sports is it's, it's sports are so un, uniting and um, they're, they're a very important fabric of our society uh, in, in the United States. And, um, and I love, uh, you know, I loved the, the, the game, the, the time that I did get to play. Um, but, but in the moment, a lot of times I didn't, uh, I didn't enjoy it as much. So I guess that would be something I would tell myself before I started playing <laughs> instead of after, but you know, when you get on the field and you get that shot, obviously you got to focus and do your job, but have fun, enjoy it. You know, don't, don't, don't worry so much about the result. Just let it rip. You know, 
a lot of that whole entire enjoy it could also be related to any anything that you do, right? So not just football or um, or work. I know the last time I was out the sea uh, for a sailor, you know, your last time out the sea is supposed to be something special, but right. I didn't know my last time out the sea was my last time. Yeah, that's true. I, I mean, same thing with football. I didn't know I, was, I got I played that game on on Saturday, I think, and I got cut on on like Wednesday, <laughs> the next week, and I didn't know it was coming. I, I was grateful. I got I only played in one game in the NFL, and I was grateful that I got to play, and I did just fine. You know, it was just the next round of cuts were coming, and that's what happened. Um, so I'm glad I got the opportunity. I'm glad I I did uh, I did enjoy that moment. I will say, <laughs> you know, playing out there was a little less pressure because it was a preseason game. It wasn't a you know, it wasn't a freaking Super Bowl or something. Um, but uh, so I kind of just enjoyed it, you know, and then it was uh, it was really that was really special. But yeah, to your point, you know, I didn't know that was going to be it. I figured I'd have at least a couple more. But nope. So the last question we have for you is what strategy did you employ to get into the right mindset for transitioning out of the military? Hmm. Oh, what strategy did I employ? I think asking people for help was the number one. <laughs> asking advice of others, you know, it's hard to do. Like we're we're kind of wired that way, um, which is ironic because we don't do anything alone in the military. But you know, part of that's I think you know a masculinity thing too. But not only women do the same thing. A lot of women that served, uh, you know, struggle with asking for help too. I think, I think sometimes it's less pride and more like, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to burden somebody with my stuff. You know, I don't want to do that. I want to. I, I take care. I, I can take care of myself. It's fine. You know, I don't want to. Not under. Not realizing that sometimes. Sometimes what we need in life, when I'm talking about when I'm speaking to these other people, um, sometimes what we need and, and, and myself too, or any of us, but I mean, you, you'll understand what I'm getting at. Like sometimes we need to be the one helping somebody to help ourselves. So it's like understanding that you, by asking somebody for help, you, you may be providing them with a, the opportunity that they need in that moment. You know, they may, they may need to feel, um, purpose purposeful they may need to feel feel like they um uh, matter to somebody else and if they weren't around um things might not be going so smooth you know like sometimes we need that i felt that way uh many times in my life especially when i was younger where i was like you know what if i wasn't around everybody'd be fine like nothing would change i mean yeah my my family be sad that i was gone but like it's not like the world would be any worse off. And that's not a good feeling. Like no one wants to feel that. We want to feel like, even if it's just in our little microcosm that that we met, you know, we, we make a difference. And we met the fact that we're here matters and we're needed. You know, we all want to belong and, and feel like we contribute in some way. And so if you need help with something, it could be a little thing, it could be a big thing. Ask for it, you know, just just ask for it because. You never know the opportunity you might be giving somebody else by doing that. Um, and and the, it might be maybe exactly what they need. They just, they may need to be of service, you know, and you're, and you're giving somebody an opportunity to be of service. It doesn't always have to be you. That's the one fixing all the problems and saving the world. You know, sometimes other people can save too. So uh, that, that's a, that's a big one. That's a big one. Um, that's a, it's, it's kind of tough to learn, but once you learn it, um, it's, it's very valuable. It's very valuable. And, and then when it's your turn, when somebody asks you for help, understand, even if you, even if you got a lot going on, um, you know, and maybe you can only provide a little bit of time and energy, just try, you know, just try to fit it in, try to figure it out. Don't, don't leave people hanging. Um, which yeah, can be, it can be daunting. It can be a lot, but, um, but you know, we're all in this mess together. <laughs> Just trying to figure it out, just like in the movie. <laughs> Wandering around the spinning ball of chaos, which is another line stolen from a veteran buddy of mine. Just trying to figure it out. <laughs> Nate, I want to thank you for being part of the change 
not just bitching about the problem. I want to thank you for bringing awareness to the crisis that us transitioning service members and soon to be veterans are facing. And I want to thank you for being part of our inspiration and just for being absolutely fucking amazing. Seriously. Thank you for that. Um, I want to ask you, um, how can our viewers and our tribe get a hold of you or your organization? Well, um, you know, uh, MVP, uh, the Merging Vets and Players website is at vets and players, uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah, vets and players.org. Um, on social media, on Twitter, they're at vets and players on Instagram. It's at merging vets and players, but vets and players.org is the website. Uh, and you can find, you can become a member that way. You can reach out to our team and connect with us. Uh, if you have an idea for an event or for, you know, you want to try and, and get a chapter going, or, or you've got people in your network or you yourself want to contribute in some way, um, reach out to us and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we connect with everybody. We don't, you know, we get, we get, we do get a lot of emails. So unless it's like some random sales spam, we pretty much respond to everything. And, uh, uh, but especially if you're, a, a, you know, an eligible member, if you're, if you're a combat vet, former professional athlete, um, connect with us, become a member. There's no obligation. It doesn't cost anything. You don't have to do anything really, if you don't want to, but at least check us out. And, uh, and if we're in a city near you, we'd love to have you to a session, to a huddle. Um, but you can also join us on the virtual. And, and like I said, we have a lot of different pop-up events happening in places where we don't have chapters yet. Uh, so you can track all that. Um, and as for me, you know, I do have a website too. I've got, uh, uh nateboyer.org is the website. Um, but you can, you see me, you can find me online on social media at, uh, at Nate Boyer 37, 37 was my college number. So um, that's why that's, that's why that's in my handle, but it's, it's that on Instagram and, and Twitter and all that. And, uh, yeah, um, that's the, that's kind of the best way, um, uh, to, to connect, but, you know, we'd love to hear, hear from, from y'all and, um, continue to grow the, to grow the mission with you. Yeah. Like Yogi said, thank you, man, for coming on here. Thanks, You're an inspiration to not just us, to a lot of other veterans and NFL football players out there, because we definitely have witnessed how they said that they're like inspired by some of the things that you're doing. So well, thank I'll, you for say, I'll say I'll say all athletes and not just the NFL. in the movie. It's definitely focused on NFL because that's how we started. But all professional athletes, any sport. Um, yeah, I'll have to agree with you on there because I, I saw at the. Uh, uh, first and first and goal project there was definitely a mixture of pro athletes and other actors there that were just there just to be a part of helping out veterans and helping out um, people that are going through the transition so right. that, that that's really awesome again thanks man um thank you everybody man. that's oh yeah brother to everybody that's listening it's your transition Take charge of it. It's not all rainbows and unicorns. Return to roots.